Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa ba'd. Before we begin with the final speech of tonight's event, I would like to invite Dr. Zakir Naik from India. A brief background about Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir is a medical doctor by professional training. Dr. Zakir Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation based in Mumbai. Dr. Zakir clarifies viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. Throughout the last 13 years, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,300 public talks in the USA, Canada, the UK, Italy, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Egypt, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, Trinidad, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of the USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, held in Chicago, USA in April 2000, was a resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri Sri Ravi Shankar on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of the sacred scriptures, held at Palace Grounds in Bangalore on the 21st of January 2006, was highly appreciated by people of both faiths. In the issue, dated 22nd of February 2009, on the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009, Amongst the billion plus population of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 82. In the special list of the top 10 spiritual gurus of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 3 after Baba Ramdev and Sisi Ravi Shankar, being the only Muslim in the list. The Sunday Express, dated the 31st of January 2010, published the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2010. And amongst the billion plus population of India, with 36 names from the 2009 list deleted, wherein Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 89. From amongst the eight Muslims in this list of 100, Dr. Zakir Naik was the only Muslim Islamic preacher and orator the others being a political secretary, a politician, a government official, a business magnate, and three film personalities. Amongst the spiritual and religious gurus, though he was the only Muslim and number three in 2009 list, this year, 2010, Dr. Zakir Naik topped the list of spiritual and religious gurus for his preaching of Islam followed by Jaggi Vasudev at number 94, Baba Ramdev at 99, and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar at number 100, respectively. Dr. Zakir Naik was recently also selected and listed in the 500 most influential Muslims in the world without any specific ranking, published by the George Washington University in the USA. Our dear Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahimahullah, the world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion called Dr. Zakir Naik Didat Plus in the year 1994. He presented a plaque in May 2000 with the engraving, 
awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years has taken me 40 years to accomplish. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries throughout the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than a hundred of his talks, dialogues, debates and symposia are available on DVDs and VCDs. He has also been the author of many books on Islam and comparative religion. So we are indeed blessed to have the opportunity to have with us Dr. Zakir Naik, who will be uh, not addressing any specific subject, but rather we have a special program entitled Ask Dr. Zakir Naik, where you, the audience, have the whole time to be able to question this great speaker on Islamic topics. So I would like to invite to share the stage our dear brother, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik from India. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Allah Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bilikma. Wal maazit al-hasna. Wajadun billati ahasan. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yasilli amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisaani yafka wa kawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure and honor for me to address the people of Dubai once again in a short span of only seven months. And as many of you may be aware, that in the month of Ramadan, about seven months back, in August 2009, I was invited for the program of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad bin Ashid al-Maktoum. And I had given two talks. The first talk I gave was on Dawa or destruction. And the second talk was on the topic of misconceptions about Islam. And I gave a speech of approximately one and a half hour which was followed by question and session for about four hours. The program started at 10 o'clock and we were forced to end at 3.30 because the Sahar time, the Sahri during month of Ramadan was just approaching. So I spoke for five and a half hours. It was one of my longest program in any part of the world. But due to the length of the program, I had to cut short my speech of misconception about Islam where I said that there are 20 most common questions. And I was only able to give the reply to 13 most common misconceptions. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be invited for the Dubai International Peace Convention and to speak in the final concluding session. So I've decided that before having the open question or session, I'll just complete the replies to the seven pending questions amongst the most common questions. And as I'd mentioned earlier in my speech, that da'wah is a duty of every Muslim. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. There are various different styles as well as strategies in conveying the message of Islam. Some of them are less effective, while the others are more effective. The most common methodology used by the Muslims when they speak with non-Muslims is that they say a hundred good things about Islam. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with these hundred good points they have mentioned about Islam, yet 
at the back of his mind he will start thinking oh you are the same muslim who is a fundamentalist ah you are the same muslims who are terrorist ah you are the people who have more than one wife ah you are the people who have spread your religion with the sword these few negative points at the back of their mind will prevent them from accepting the beauty of islam so whenever i meet a non muslim the first thing i ask him up front is what do you feel is wrong with islam with your limited knowledge whether right or wrong what do you feel is wrong with islam and i make him comfortable that he can ask any question on islam he can feel free he can criticize islam he can attack the quran if he wants i make him comfortable and ask him what does he feel is wrong with islam and after he is made comfortable that non muslim he poses about three or four questions and in the experience that i have for the past couple of decades i have come to know that the non muslims they have about 20 most common questions about islam so when he poses three or four questions invariably it falls amongst these 20 most common questions these common questions how do they come in the mind of the non muslim depending how the media portrays islam these questions they arise in the mind of the non muslim and today we know in the international media whether it be the newspapers the international magazines the radio broadcast stations the satellite television channels we find there is virulent propaganda about islam we find that the media is spreading misconceptions about islam and depending on how they portray islam these 20 common questions arise in the minds of the non muslims the 20 questions we have today a couple of decades earlier they were different maybe a couple of decades later they will change if every muslim knows the replies with reason logic and science quoting the scriptures of islam and the other religions and are able to know the replies to all these common questions even if he cannot convert or change the non muslim faith at least he can neutralize the animosity which is there in the minds of the non muslims and as i mentioned earlier i have written a book the replies to the common questions asked by non muslims and it's available on the internet too on www.irf.net and 7 months back when i was in dubai i was only able to cover the replies of the first 13 most common questions or misconceptions that are posed by the non muslims regarding islam for those who are not there i'll just mention the question without giving the reply and i'll give the reply only to the last seven inshallah today the most common misconceptions regarding islam in the minds of the non muslim is regarding the word jihad the number two misconception is that the non muslims think that the muslims they are fundamentalist the third misconception is that muslims are terrorist the fourth misconception is that islam is a religion which was spread by the sword the fifth most common question is that why does islam allow a man to marry more than one woman why is polygamy or polygyny allowed in islam the sixth most common question is that if islam allows a man to have more than one wife then why does not islam allow a woman to have more than one husband the seventh most common question is that why are women in islam degraded or subjugated by keeping them in hijab the eighth most common question asked by the non muslim is that why does islam permit a muslim to have non veg food the ninth misconception about islam is that why do muslims even if they have non veg why do they slaughter the animals so mercilessly they do zabiha and they kill the animal with pain and torture if they want to kill why don't they kill by jhatka 
or just by stunning, it's more merciful. The tenth misconception about Islam is that today's scientific research says that whatever you eat, it has an effect on your behavior. So the Muslims, they eat animals and they behave like animals. The eleventh misconception, most common misconception about Islam in the minds of the non-Muslim is that if Islam is against idol worship, then why do the Muslims, they bow down to the Kaaba in the Salah? The Muslims, they are the biggest idol worshippers in the world. The twelfth most common question is that if Islam is a universal religion, then why doesn't Islam permit a non-Muslim to enter into the two holy cities, that is Makkah and Medina? And the thirteenth most common question which I replied to last time was, why Islam does not permit a Muslim to have pork? And in a span of one and a half hours, I was only able to complete the replies to thirteen most common questions or misconceptions about Islam. Inshallah, in the next 45 minutes, I will try and give the replies to the balance seven most common questions or misconceptions about Islam. The 14th amongst the most common questions asked by the non-Muslim is that why does Islam prohibit a Muslim to drink alcohol? Why are intoxicants prohibited for the Muslims? Why is alcohol prohibited? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuh al-lazina amun, O you believe, innam al-khamru al-maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al-azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishthum minam al-shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, fashta nibul al-lukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. This verse of the Quran from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90 says, that intoxicants, and gambling, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. So based on this verse of the Quran, the Muslims as a whole, they abstain from drinking alcohol. The same message is also repeated in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, which says that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever has it is deceived. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that do not be drunk with wine. So if you read the Bible, and if you believe in the Bible, even the Christians, according to the commandments of the Bible, they're supposed to abstain from drinking alcohol. The same message is even repeated in the Hindu scriptures. Alcohol has been prohibited in the Hindu scriptures in several places. In Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 225, and is prohibited in several places, even in the Vedas. Let's try and understand the logical reasons why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, prohibited the Muslims from having alcohol. Today, science tells us that every human being, he has an inhibitory center. This inhibitory center, it inhibits a human being from doing things which are wrong. For example, the human beings know that using abusive language is incorrect. Especially when we speak to elders or to our parents. If we have to go for the call of nature, we will not do it in the public. We will go to the restroom. Our inhibitory center prevents us from doing it in public because we know it is wrong. But when a person is intoxicated, his inhibitory center is inhibited. That is the reason we see that a person who is intoxicated, he uses abusive language. He even abuses the elders and many a time even his parents. Because his inhibitory center is inhibited, we find many a time that those who are intoxicated, they urinate in their own clothes. They do it in public. We find many a time that these people who are intoxicated, they can't even walk properly. They can't even talk properly. They can't behave properly because the inhibitory center is inhibited. 
Furthermore, today scientific research tells us that when a person is intoxicated, he does many things which are prohibited. According to the statistics of the FBI report of the year 1990, in the Department of Justice, Criminal Victimization Survey Bureau of US, it says that in the year 1990, on average, 1,756 rapes took place on average every day. And the report said that the majority, more than 50%, of the rapes that were committed were committed when the person was intoxicated. Today research tells us that in America, approximately 8% of the Americans, they do incest. Incest means having sexual relationship, mother with son, daughter with father, brother with sister, having sexual relationship with the close relatives. 8% every 12th or 13th American you meet, according to statistics, it says he has committed incest. And the survey says majority of them, either one or both of them, they were in a state of intoxication. Today's scientific research says one of the major associated causes of the most deadly disease today, AIDS, is alcohol. But normally when we meet many people, who have alcohol, they say, I'm only a social drinker. My father is only a social drinker. Social drinker means person has only one or two pegs. So I can control myself. I don't get intoxicated. When you meet any alcoholic and you ask the background, no alcoholic ever has started drinking alcohol to become alcoholic. He starts as a social drinker. And later on, he becomes alcoholic. I challenge to show me a single social drinker who has been drinking for several years and has never got intoxicated at least once in his lifetime. Even if you find, if you ask a social drinker, if you do a survey, even if he's for a couple of years a social drinker, sometime or the other, he may have got intoxicated. And even if a person gets intoxicated once in his lifetime, and if he commits a crime of rape or incest, imagine, after he regains his consciousness, the damage cannot be undone. Neither to the victim, neither to the person who has done it. It's an irreparable loss. Imagine, if in the state of intoxication, the person has committed rape or committed incest, the person cannot forgive himself. That's the reason. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith of Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number four, in the book of intoxications, book number 30, Hadith number 3371, the beloved Prophet said that alcohol is the key of all evils. It is the most shameless evil. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number four, in the book of intoxication, book number 30, hadith number 3392. Our beloved Prophet said that anything which intoxicates you in large quantity is even prohibited in small quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. Our beloved Prophet also said, it's mentioned Sunan Ibn Majah, Volume number four, in the book of intoxication, book number 30, hadith number 3380, our beloved prophet said that all 10 categories of people who deal with alcohol are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person who distills alcohol, the person who has it distilled by someone, the person who distills for someone, the person who drinks it, the person who transports it, the person for whom it is transported, the person who serves it, the person who sells it, the person who utilizes the money of the sale of alcohol, the person who buys it, the person who buys it for someone else. All these 10 categories of people, 
who deal with alcohol, our beloved Prophet said, the curse of Allah is on them. But today, my colleagues, that is the medical doctors, they have a different approach. What they say? That alcohol, it is not an addiction. They say that alcoholism is a disease. And they say that we have to be sympathetic towards the alcoholic. The new technology, new ways. As the sick person, like how someone is sick, you have to visit him and you have to solace, show kindness to him. So today's medical doctors, they say that alcoholism is a disease. You have to pray for them. Poor man is sick. You have to be sympathetic towards him. And I reply to them. And in one of my messages that comes on the Peace TV, and I always repeat it, that if alcoholism is a disease, it is only disease that has got no viral or germ as its cause. It is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on the radio broadcast stations, on the television channels. It is the only disease that has a licensed outlet for sale. It is the only disease that gets a revenue for many governments of the world. It is the only disease that brings violent deaths on the highways. It is the only disease that destroys families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our creator says and gives the reply in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Rich to memory shaitan, it is a Satan's handiwork. First then you will come to Flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. It is not a disease, it is a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. That's the reason. In most of the religious scriptures, besides the Quran and the Hadith, alcohol has been prohibited. The 15th most common question asked by the non Muslims is In Islam, why are two women witnesses equal to one man's witness? Indicating that Islam degrades the woman. Let me tell you that the Quran, in no less than five places, talks about witnesses without mentioning the gender, whether male or female. Except in one place, the Quran specifies and says that two women witnesses is equal to one witness of man. And that is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 282, which is the longest ayah, longest verse of the Quran. It is the part of the longest surah of the Quran, Surah Baqarah. And the verse number 282 is the longest verse of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that, Ya listen, Amun, O you belief, when you involve in any financial transaction involving future obligation for a fixed period of time, put it down in writing and get two men as witnesses amongst yourself. It further goes and says, if you can't find two men, then one man and two women. And it continues, if one of them errs or makes a mistake, the second will correct her. Now this verse of the Quran is exclusively talking about financial transactions and nothing else. Let me give you an example for better understanding. For example, if someone wants to undergo a surgery, maybe a major operation, the best for him would be that he takes the advice of two qualified surgeons. It is the best for safety. If he can't find two qualified surgeons, at least one qualified surgeon, MS or MCH, and two MBBS doctors. Because an MBBS doctor cannot do a major surgery. You can't have four MBBS doctors and do the surgery. Best would be two qualified surgeons for a master of surgery. If you can't find two qualified surgeons, master of surgery, at least one master of surgery and two bachelor of surgery. Similarly, in financial transaction, because in Islam, the financial burden is put on the shoulders of the man in Islam. The woman need not look after any financial burden. In Islam, before a woman is married, it is the duty of the father and the brother 
and after she's married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. So because of this, if it's an Islamic society, a man is more financially aware as compared to a woman. Because of this, in financial transaction, when you take witnesses, take two men. If you can't find two men, then one man and two women. Because if one of them errs, the Arabic word is tazil, makes a mistake. Some people translate as if one of them forgets. It's not forget. It is if one of the women makes a mistake, the second will correct her. There are several verses in the Quran which talk about witnesses without mentioning the gender. For example, Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108, that if death approaches you, put the will, the inheritance in writing and take two witnesses. The gender is not mentioned. Quran says in Surah Talaq, chapter number 65, verse number 2, that when someone gives talaq, take two witnesses. The gender is not specified. Should be honest, should be just. Gender is not specified. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4, that if someone lays an allegation against the modesty of a woman, produce four witnesses, otherwise, 80 lashes. Four witnesses doesn't specify the gender, whether it's male or female. If you cannot get four witnesses, and if you make an allegation against the modesty of women, 80 lashes. And one verse of the Quran is explicitly clear, which equates one male and one female. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 6 says, that if someone lays an allegation against the spouse, or the husband lays an allegation against the wife, and he does not have any evidences, no witnesses, his solitary evidence is sufficient. And he has to take oath four times in the name of Allah. And fifth time, pronounce a curse on him if he's lying. Immediately the next verse, after verse number 6 and 7 of Surah Nur, Surah Nur chapter 24 verse number 8 says, but if the wife, if she also does not have any witnesses, she too, can be a solitary evidence by taking oath four times. And the fifth one, being a curse on herself if she's lying. So here, it is clearly mentioned in the Quran that one female is equal to one male. So based on this, most of the fuqahas and the jurists, they agree that only in cases of financial transaction, witnesses of two women is equal to one man. And some jurists say, that in cases of murder, where the nature of the female may be difficult for her to give evidence, maybe two women is equal to one man. But all the other cases, one woman is equal to one man witness. For example, in the starting of the month of Ramadan, in the sighting of moon, you require one witness. In the ending of Ramadan, you require two witnesses. It does not make a difference whether it's a male or a female. Only in some country it has to be a man, should have a beard of the standard fist, then only can you take the witness. And I have one more strong argument that the beloved wife of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She has narrated no less than 2,210 ahadith. 2,210 ahadith. And she was the only witness. So 2,210 say hadith, which are basis of the Sharia, is a witness only of one woman. She was the wife of the Prophet. Hazraisha, may Allah be pleased with her. So this clearly indicates that one witness of woman is equal to one witness of man. There are cases in which, how in financial transaction men is preferred to women, there are certain cases in which woman witness is taken, men witness is not taken. For example, while giving the burial bath of a female Muslimah, witness should be a woman. A man cannot be a witness. Unless in certain conditions where it's a forest and there are no human beings, then the husband can be. But otherwise, generally, for the burial bath, for the janaza ghusl of a woman, the witness is accepted of a woman, not of a man.
alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, and you're watching Peace TV. The 16th most common question asked about Islam is that why does Islam do injustice to women by only allowing 50% of the share given to the male counterpart? That why do women in Islam inherit only half what is inherited by the male counterpart? It's injustice to them. This is the 16th most common misconception. As far as inheritance is concerned, the Quran speaks about inheritance in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 180, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 240, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 79, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 33, Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108. Several places it speaks about inheritance, but the exact share is mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 11 and 12 and Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 176. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 11 that as for the inheritance of your children the male will get double the share of the female. If only daughters two or more they share in a two-third. If only one daughter she gets half. In what you leave for your parents if there are children the parents each get one sixth share if no children the mother gets one third if there are brothers and sisters the mother gets one sixth verse number 12 says in what your wives leave for you after death the husbands they get half if there are no children they get one fourth if there are children in what you leave for your wives the wives get one fourth if there are no children one eighth if there are children don't get confused difficult to remember go home open the quran don't know arabic read the translation surah nisa chapter number four verse number 11 and 12. generally agree in majority of the cases the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart but there are cases in which female and male inherit exactly the same as I mentioned if the person who has died has children mother and father both get one sixth or if the person who has died has got no children but leaves a brother and sister both get one sixth there are cases in which sometimes the female inherits double if a female dies and leaves behind no children but has a husband and mother and father the husband gets half mother gets one third the father gets one sixth so mother gets double than the father but there are rare cases I do agree as a normal general policy the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart if his daughter and son son inherits double than that of the daughter husband and wife husband inherits double than that of the wife I agree with it what is the logical reason the reason as I mentioned earlier the financial burden in Islam is put on the shoulders of the men as far as the women are concerned before she's married it is the duty of the father and the brother and after she's married it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after a lodging boarding clothing and all financial aspects she need not work for a living she's financially secured based on this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the shares and let me give you an example suppose there's a person who dies and leaves behind 150,000 dirhams and he has one son and one daughter after giving the shares of the wives and the other relatives if 150,000 dirham are remaining from his inheritance and he has one son and one daughter the son will inherit 100,000 dirhams and the daughter will inherit 50,000 dirhams now I'm asking you a question would you prefer being a son who inherits 100,000 dirhams and maybe 80 to 90 percent of that wealth you may have to spend on your family because you are the bread earner or would you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams 
and keeping everything for yourself, not even spending a single dirham on anyone else. So logically, but naturally, you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams and not spending a single dirham on anyone else, rather than inheriting 100,000 dirhams and spending 80%, 90%, 100% of it on looking after the other members of the family. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. If he would have given both of them equal share, then I would have to give a talk on men's rights in Islam. Then the men would object, what kind of religion is this? We have to look after the family, and when we inherit, we inherit equal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees to it that is just with everyone. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. The 17th most common question asked by the non-Muslim regarding Islam is that why do Muslims believe in life after death? How can you prove logically about the year after, about life after death? And many a time there are non-Muslims who pose this question to me. Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. You have given a lecture on Quran modern science. You are so scientific. But how do you believe in this blind belief, life after death? Science hasn't proved it. So they pose the question that if Islam is a logical religion, how do you justify life after death? I tell them that life after death is not just a blind belief. It's a logical belief. And I've given the talk on Quran modern science. And I've said that there are more than 6,000 verses of the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 verses of the Quran, they speak about science. But today, science hasn't advanced so much to prove everything of the Quran. So if we analyze, say approximately 80% what the Quran speaks, which is related with science, has been proved to be 100% correct. 20% it is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. We don't know. So when 80% of the Quran is proved to be 100% perfect according to scientific facts, and 20% is neither wrong, neither right, not even 0.1% of the 20% has been proved wrong, my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and 20% is ambiguous. My logic says that inshallah, even that 20% would be correct. So it is a logical belief. It is not a blind belief. This is one way of proving life after death. The other strategy I use to prove over life after death is by asking a common question. That is robbing, good or bad? And I'd like to ask you that question here from the audience. Is robbing good or bad? Good or bad? Bad. Who says robbing is good? Raise your hand. No one. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Large audience, maybe more than 15,000. Not a single person says robbing is good. No, I... I am trying to impersonate. For example, I am a logical person. I am a scientific person. I'm behaving like a non-Muslim, like an atheist, but I claim myself to be a logical person and a scientific person, and I say that robbing is good. Believe me, I am a logical person, I'm a scientific person. I say robbing is good, and I like robbing. And I'm giving you a chance, this large audience of more than 15,000 people, I am giving you a chance to prove to me robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. I've told you, I'm a logical person, I'm a scientific person. Give me one logical reason why robbing is bad for me and I will stop robbing. I will tell you why it is good for me. When I rob a person, I can go and eat biryani, I can go to a five-star hotel, easy, easy money. Now you tell me why robbing is bad. Don't give me 10, 20 reasons. Give me only one logical scientific reason why robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. Can anyone give me? Yes, brother. If you rob someone, can you speak a bit louder? Mashallah. Very good. 
Brother Singh, if I take something from someone, I'm taking away something from him. I agree. It is a loss for that person, but benefit for me. I agree with you. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. It is bad for the person who has been robbed. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. I am logical, I am scientific. I agree it is bad for the person who has been robbed. Tell me why it is bad for me, I will stop robbing. Yes, brother, loudly. Someone will rob me, will I like it? Very good. Brother, I am a big mafia. I have got 100 bodyguards and all of them are behind the stage. I am a big robber, I am not a small robber. For a small robber, it is bad. Someone may rob you. I'm a big mafia. I have got 100 bodyguards all behind, you know, all with AK-47. I'm logical, I'm scientific. I'm a big robber. For small robbers, it's not good. Somebody may rob you. So, why it is bad for me? Yes, brother. Hello, my name is Nadeem. Why is robbing bad for me? I'll be bad for other people. I agree with you, my son. Why it is bad for me? I agree. Because your name is going to be bad. My name? My name is very good. <laughs> Why it is going to be bad? I'm telling you, my name gets bad, I have no problem. As long as I'm benefiting. When I rob someone, maybe 100,000 dirham if I rob, I can go to a five-star hotel, I can see a movie, I can enjoy, I can eat biryani. Easy money. Other people are just logging out. Me, I get easy money. You know, robbing is very easy. Anyone?